Uh, the festival has also asked me just to um, let you know that uh, outside books by the authors in this program can be purchased from Greenlight Bookstore. Um, it's outside on the plaza. And the authors will be signing their books immediately following this program in the rotunda uh, downstairs. And so authors, um, I'd ask you as well uh, to go directly to your signing tables after this. Um, and we do have an event after this, I believe. So um, we'll please ask everyone to um, clear the room um, so the next audience can come on in. Um, and now let me tell you a little bit about the authors I have with me. Uh, Carmen Buyosa, uh, who's here on the end, is the author of a dozen volumes of poetry and 19 novels, the most recent um, being The Book of Eve, which we're here to uh, uh, discuss today, as well, the four book, as well as four books of essays and 10 plays, seven of which have been staged. She's a distinguished lecturer at Macaulay Honors College at CUNY, a Guggenheim fella, Fellow, as well as Coleman Center and uh, Dodd Fellow. Brioza has won many prizes, uh, including the Casa de America and the Rosalia de Castro in Spain, uh, the Zegers and the Liberatur in Germany, and she splits life between Coyacan and Brooklyn. Leila Abulela, uh, who we have here in the middle, uh, and her, we'll be discussing today her recently published no novel, River Spirit, which was described by the New York Times as dazzling, a novel of war, love, faith, womanhood, and crucially, the tussle over truth and public narratives. Leila's previous novels are Bird Summons, The Kindness of Enemies, The Translator, Minaret, and Lyrics Alley, fiction winner of the Scottish Book Awards. Her story collection, Elsewhere, Home, won the Saltire Fiction Book of the Year. Leila is a winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing, and her work has been translated into 15 languages. She is Honorary Professor of the Word Center at the University of Aberdeen. Itamar Vieira Jr., uh, here on my right, was born in Salvador, Bahia in 1979. He holds a doctorate in Ethnic and African Studies. Before Crooked Plow, the novel we will be discussing today, he published a collection of short stories entitled The Executioner's Prayer, which was nominated for Brazil's largest literary award, the Jabuti. Crooked Plow won the prestigious 2018 Leia Award in Portugal. Um, so thank you to, to the three of you uh, for being here with me today. Uh, it's great to be able to discuss your books. Uh, Leila, I thought we could maybe start with you and um, have you maybe start out by reading a little bit. I think you're going to read from near the um, beginning of the novel. You can sort of situate us a little bit to just give us a little bit of, uh, of a feel for the book, if you could. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, the, the, uh, the novel is a coming of age, um, sort of a narrative of this young girl during this very turbulent uh, period in, in Sudan's history. And uh, she becomes. In, oh, it has to be closer. Okay, thank you. Uh, she becomes in, enslaved at at uh, at some point, and then um, and then not, and so on. So um, uh, this this is just a, a, a small part of the showing her attachment to 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 the river, uh, which started off as the White Nile and then ended up being the Blue Nile, which is the one in in cartoon. As soon as she had arrived. The river, huge and strumming, claimed her. After years in the desert, she felt welcomed by the water, knowing it to be the timeless companion, the one that ran without effort, gave without needing, sang and sang the ancient tunes she had heard in her childhood, the songs she had yearned for and listened out for that she had only half understood, but it did not matter because listening was more important. She could strive to understand at her own leisure. Tomorrow or the day after or the day after, the river would still be there for her, patient and strong, rich and always flowing in the same direction. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Leila, if I can go a little bit rogue based on, our, on um, what we were discussing earlier, but uh, I can't help but be struck sort of by landscape. And I think this is actually relevant in, in ways too to Itamar's work and to uh, Carmen's as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of, of landscape and sort of the land in, in River Spirit and sort of how you, how you saw that um, as, as you were sort of constructing the novel. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I saw it as a, as a, I saw the land as, as the symbol of stability, given these, these big powers that were you know, competing at this point. Uh, uh, Sudan was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, and then this was the time when Europe started to uh, look into Africa, and uh, you know, Britain eventually took over from, from, from the Turks, and this is what the book shows this process of what's happening. But I wanted to write it from the point of view of the Sunnis themselves, and I thought that they would be, uh, as in this case of this, this character, sort of having an attachment for, for, for the land and, and for the river and, and for all these places. And of course, it, was, it is these natural resources that are attracting all these big powers anyway to start with. I mean, they were there because they wanted the gold, they wanted, and of course they were also wanting, um, you know, manpower. They wanted uh, the, 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 the kind of the slave, the, the, the slave trade, the East African slave trade differed from the, the Atlantic slave trade in that the Ottomans and the Egyptians wanted men as, um, to work for the army you know, to, 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 to serve in their armies, and they wanted women as domestic um, uh, labor. It, it, it wasn't really uh, attached to capitalism as, as, as we know about it in, 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 the, in the West Coast of Africa. Yeah. Well, uh, Itamar is sort of coming to, to Crooked Plow. I mean, the landscape as well, um, it, I, I think we can say it's a character, in a, in a way, in the, in the novel itself. Um, and it, it plays a really important um, role, I think, in, in some of the discussions you're, you're trying to, to forward about. I mean, there's a question about land and land ownership and who, um, which is a, obvi obviously a question um, that runs throughout the history of Brazil. But um, I wonder if you could talk about landscape in your novel and um, how it became sort of such a vivid and important part of the novel. Posso que que eu traduzo? Sim, sim, sim. Então, eu estou perguntando a Simpson, é a questão da paisagem, sim, sim. É, né? E como a terra é, é quase como um personagem, assim, é um, assume as proporções de um personagem. Acho que dá para falar sim. assim, né? No, no romance. E como você viu isso e assim como como é como você né? qual foi sua consciência sim. sobre isso? Um, I'm sorry, I I sp I, I'm going to speak in, in Portuguese in Eric translated uh, to English. Um, eu, a, a minha compreensão é de que um, a, a terra uh, para essa história, para, para essas personagens, é uma condição essencial de sua existência, de suas existências. So he's saying that you know the land becomes this sort of it's it's a necessary condition of of their subsistence of their the, the character's existence. We follow sort of principally these these two uh, sisters. But uh, eu estou falando de um que é dos direitos mais elementares de, de qualquer ser humano, uh, que é o direito ao ao chão onde pisa, a terra onde vive, onde se trabalha é o é o solo da da rua onde trafegamos, o chão uhum. da nossa casa, e acho que pensando nessa perspectiva, a paisagem é uma personagem, é parte importante da, da vida e da história é, dessas personagens que estão em, em Crooked Plot. Uhum. Uh, let me see if I can re remember all of it, but the, the, the principal thing here is he's saying, you know, land is sort of, he was interested in looking at land as sort of this most essential of our rights and sort of, you know, the right to have, um, you know, a, a, essentially a floor beneath your feet. Um, and then also, um, you know, that, that essentially, um, you know, the land, the places that we, that we walk and that we exist um, are sort of defined, these defining elements of, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, um, of, of our lives, right? They come to, to sort of determine our lives uh, in ways that perhaps we don't even realize. And, um, you know, it's, it's the land that gives life to these characters. Thank you. Here's again. All right, that's great. Um, in the case of, of Carmen, you know, I, I actually want, I mean, certainly landscape does, does come in a little bit. Um, I want to, bring our conversation to, to just a little bit of a, of a different direction, 
But, but oh, go ahead. I do have something to say about uh, Great. what the land means for my Eve. Okay. That I think is essential to the to the novel, and it is essential also to the character, and it's essential to us, because in the retelling her own story, Eve says. Uh, she doesn't like the paradise because the paradise is smellless. There's no smell, there's no taste, there's no real color, the time doesn't move. Uh, so there's no what we call life. It's a different space, but not, not what when she sees the earth, what she, she doesn't want to stay there. So she goes out and when she looks at this beauty that is nature and that is the earth, she just goes wild. Adam is following her and he is not that happy. He wants to come back. By then we have an angel keeping the door of whom she's going to steal the fire because it's also retelling the myths differently. Uh, and. Uh, she loves the earth and uh, makes a relationship with it that differs with the relationship we have made with it. We have considered ourselves Edenites, and as Edenites, we have arrived to the earth as if we were foreigners, and we have mistreated this poor planet. And that's why we are living in this ecological catastrophe. Excuse my English, it's a disaster, I'll never learn it. I tried to learn it since I was a little girl, but English doesn't want me. <laughs> um, so that's, it's central to the novel because retelling the myth of Eve is also retelling our relationship with nature. So thanks for bringing up the theme that yeah. uh, uh, I, I, I was not prepared to answer, but when you asked it because of the passage that Leila beautifully uh, read and I listened to Bahia's uh, uh, answer, I had to say this little thing. So uh, no, absolutely, and, and, you, and you said it so beautifully. So, so thank you for that. And it, it's interesting because I think this question of the land um, that, that we've discussed also feeds into um, something else we were, were sort of exchanging um, messages about before this panel, which is um, all of your works deal with myths in some way, right? Like or mythologies or accepted um, historical um, historical versions, I guess, right? And uh, looking at, at, at challenging those, uh, even the apple, um, or I'm going to say, you know, and, and this is imagery, I'm sorry, um, which, you know, sort of through the years gets... Um, takes on a certain power, right? So like Eve and the apple, um, you know, to think of a 20th uh, century example, maybe like, you know, Castro and his revolutionaries in the, in the Sierra Maestra. Um, you know, these are, these are, whether it's political or religious myths, there are sort of these very strong images that over time sort of uh, assume, you know, greater and greater proportions. And I, I wonder, you know, to what extent the three of you uh, had in mind this question of, of, of the image and recreating, in either sort of making your own images um, um, as you sort of challenged, um, you know, the various myths you were, you were trying to confront. Maybe we can start with you, Leila. Um, well, the, 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 the history that the, that the novel uh, talks about uh, involves... Um, uh, a British general who was uh, holding the capital uh, against the, re the rebels, and his name was Charles Gordon. And so he, he was um, uh, seen as a Victorian sort of hero, and uh, he was very much sort of lauded in, in, in the British press, and, and how his death in, by the hands of these uh, revolutionaries or, or re rebels, depending on whose side you're on, uh, then justified the British uh, um, invasion of, of, of Sudan and uh, there was even a Hollywood film in the, in the 1960s called Khartoum in which uh, the, the character of Gordon was played by Charlton Heston and the character of the Sudanese Mahdi who was the leader of the rebels was played by Lawrence Olivier in blackface 
And this film was just hugely, of course, successful, and, and, and uh, you know, they, they, a lot of money was spent on it and, and getting all the military details correct. And so that is what you uh, sort of, that's, that's what I want to get away from, is, is this image that I want to get away from. And uh, I want to go away from this idea of the Victorian hero and the mad, you know, uh, rebel. And, and look at the ordinary lives of the people and look at the, 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 the kind of the day-to-day -day lives of, of, of the people, the lives of the women, the lives of the, um, of the people who are, who are in, involved in all of this and caught up in, in, in all of this. So I guess for me, the images was moving away from this kind of the grand, main, according to history, main characters into the, the, the marginalized uh, characters and giving them uh, voices. That's great. Well, Carmen, you of course sort of take on, um, you know, very big image, which is you know starting with, you know, the the um, origin story in, in Christianity and sort of this moment with Eve and Adam and the apple, and uh, you do so in a, a a very interesting way that brings in not just Eve's perspective but perspective of her daughters, etc. But I, I wonder, you know, did you have that in mind? There's there's in fact a lot of uh, very vivid and uh, powerful imagery in your novel. Um, I wonder how much that was, uh, it was something you were conscious of, of, try of having to remake the imagery. I think that in most of my novels, um, I do want to tell another version. Because in most of our lives, we are surrounded by Charlton Heston's and Laurence Olivier's in blackface. And it's the customary thing. I think of our relationship with Earth, and I think of that wonderful movie, wonderful, yes, wonderful, Ooh, pathetic. Um, Marabunta was called in Spanish, where the ants are coming, and the Earth is evil, and they have to fight against the nature that is so evil. So uh, uh, we, we all live in those versions. And evidently, for me, it was central, because uh, it justifies the idea that half of the population is born to serve the other half because they deserved it, because they have made a mistake so big, or a sin, that they have be, we have been dumped into earth. So uh, she has to pay for that, and she pays with her own pleasure, life, uh, and, and it's something institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, justifying slavery in the household, in the intimacy, in everything, uh, making that solidifying in a divine myth, myth in a divine truth, uh, that Eve deserves it and has to be tied because the only act she does ruins us. So, and not only ruins us, uh, well, puts on, we have to then work. We have then to be in the earth. We stop being the Evanites. We, so it's, uh, I, I needed to retell that story. Uh, maybe of all my novels is the one that's more evident, where I retold the story of Texas, I retold the story of the first years of the colonial years in Mexico, in Heavens on Earth, that's also translated into English. So for me, retelling it is uh, an instinct. But coming up here, if I have a moment, or I spoke yeah, too much, yep. uh, coming up here, I thought, oh gosh, oh gosh, I really am a writer to the bones, because I lived it. I was going to walk Atlantic Avenue to arrive to our book fair happily, and Atlantic Avenue was crowded, was a wonderful fair. It was full of people all over, and everybody was walking so that they were looking at the products they were selling, camping happily, but I needed to arrive here. So I was challenging the street, and I went this way and that way, and I had to then avoid the sun, which the sun is light, yes, but it also destroys us, and we know it's going to be the end of this planet, but that's another story. So all that, leaving all that, finding my own way, and while all the other ones were just camping and enjoying and buying things and eating their beautiful bones with lobsters and the rest, I was doing this to find my way because I wanted to go into book world. And when I arrived here, 
just to end my little fable, sorry if I bother you. When I arrived here, I, this was my goal. I wanted to have this literary conversation, but my husband hadn't arrived, so my heart was broken. And I thought all this like, is like a metaphor of writing. You want to find the real truth. All the others are living in a way, but you really want to find the core of the, because you want to get into the, what is your heart, the heart of the writer. So I don't know if my fable works, but I couldn't avoid saying it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in Itamar, obviously, there, there are, for those who are familiar with, with Brazil, too, there are a lot of myths that you're taking on about Brazilian society. Um, I wonder if you could speak about those a little bit. Um, no sei o romance que você está enfrentando, assim, não só um mito sobre a sociedade brasileira, mas vários. Eu, 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 uh, você poderia, assim, comentar um pouco, um pouco isso? Como você, quando você sentou para escrever, como que você? Ah, acho que no Brasil, um, é, como em muitos países que passaram pelo mesmo processo de colonização e e escravidão, essas marcas ainda estão muito presentes na sociedade hoje. So he's saying, uh, he thinks that, you know, in Brazil, as in other um, uh, countries that have been colonized in the past, um, sort of the, the marks, the legacy of slavery and of colonialism is still very present and sort of breathes today. Essa é uma história até que brinca com o tempo, porque eu Eu acredito que os leitores não, não, não conseguem identificar o tempo em que a história se passa no começo, já que é uma história que ainda trata de permanências, né, de como a escravidão ela, ela ainda persiste é, no nosso cotidiano. Yeah, so he's saying there's, there's even, you know, at the, at the beginning, he's sort of even playing with this notion of time, right? Like, when, where, in, where in Brazilian history are we, in a sense? Because there's so many of, you know, it's a, it's a novel that... Um, that talks about sort of, you know, what remains from, from the period, from colonialism, from slavery, um, et cetera. And so, you know, the, the reader initially, even the Brazilian reader, um, may not be able to sort of identify when we're really talking about. É, e temos a, a, na, na história do, do romance, a famílias que vivem ainda num regime de servidão que, que remonta à escravidão de algum, em, em alguma medida. Uh, Eu não imaginava que uh, essa história fosse encontrar tantos leitores, é, até porque esse não é um, um tema, talvez hoje sim, mas no, há alguns anos não era um tema importante nem recorrente na, nas discussões que existiam na, na sociedade brasileira. So, so he's saying, you know, the, the families in these, um, the, the novel sort of follows these families who are, um, you know, are in a, uh, I, still living, this is obviously post-abolition, um, but are still living in a situation that's, you know, not so different from, it's, it's a situation of servitude, right? They're working the land, but um, the products of the land are stolen from them, um, et cetera. And, you know, it surprised, estava surpreso, dá para dizer, it surprised Itamar um, a little bit that this was a story that did sort of find so many readers, because this, this was a, a novel that was a runaway bestseller, like very, very few um, in the country. Um, and, and even, you know, for those who, who are sort of familiar with the recent political history of Brazil, there was a political, not so differently from here, there was a sort of a sharp right-wing turn um, in the middle of the last decade, and, and so it didn't seem like it was a, um, a good time for these sort of stories. In, in some way, he didn't imagine that it would find such a large readership. E acho que essa, de alguma maneira, essa surpresa com a história de que a história não 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 equaria nem encontraria leitores, faz um, eu faço um paralelo com a surpresa quando eu fui trabalhar no campo de encontrar é, essas marcas do passado ainda muito muito presentes e E num país que cada vez se urbaniza mais, parece que isso é, não, não tem importância, não tem relevância. Mas ainda há pessoas é, vivendo em uma situação, situação muito próxima à escravidão. So he said, you know, when he went, um, when he went to sort of do, uh, I guess, field work for last night, you know, when he was doing research for, for this novel, 
um, you know, and he went to find people who were working, sort of working this land in these situations. Um, you know, Brazil is a, is a country that, um, you know, is, is uh, increasingly urban and, and it's, you know, uh, it's a lot of its problems and the, the ones that people focus on tend to be around urbanization. He was surprised in a way to find so many people still today living in this situation that uh, recalls slavery. Dun, dun. Great. That's uh, all. <laughs> cool. Um, so thinking of that, I mean, you know, we're, we're in these situations, um, at, at least in, in the works of Itamar and uh, Leila, um, you know, these are situations, that, whether it's people sort of living in this quasi-slavery or people living under um, Ottoman rule uh, who are, it, it, these are situations that are very ripe for redemptive figures and, and people who, you know, people are looking for someone essentially to, to bring them, you know, to deliver them uh, from, from this situation. Uh, and I wonder, you know, in, in both of your novels, if, if you could, and we'll maybe start with you, Leila, um, you know, how, how in, oh, you were maybe out. Uh, how interested were you or not in this, in this question of, of redemptive figures in the way that, that sort of, re, you know, redemption can be, and the opportunity for redemption can really be misused and abused? Yeah. Um, when you see, uh, when you read about how people are, were feeling so um, oppressed and feeling a sense of injustice to the, to the extent that they felt that the w only way that would save them would be that a messiah would come and, and then how they, they, they rallied around the man who claimed that he was. And apparently this happens, several, this happens all over the world in oppressed uh, populations. Uh, people do rally around a figure who they believe has special powers. Usually these movements uh, piddle out. I mean, usually nothing comes out of it uh, because they realize that, you know, that, 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 that he really doesn't have any special powers. It's just in case, this case, uh, the, 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 the movement gathered, gathered momentum and, and, and sustained itself for quite a long period of, 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 of time. Um, so, but, so psychologically and emotionally, people seem to have this, this uh, um, desire to, to, to believe uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a, a very idealistic sort of person. There's a lot of idealism involved with, with, with these kind of movements. And I think that that is where the danger is because, of course, uh, humans are humans. And uh, if you take away the, the practical considerations and, and all of that, then it, it, just, it's, it, it just becomes very, um, um, you know, people's... Um, are follow, following a dream, they're finding, following an illusion, you know, rather than, than the, the, the truth. And, and, uh, and that is fascinating to see in itself because it keeps repeating itself over history where people follow kind of illusions and follow um, uh, characters that they believe are, are special, but then it, 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 it fiddles out. So. Sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, similarly, Itamar, in, in your story, um, there's not necessarily a um, you know, there, there's several ways this manifests, and, and I think, Leila, you were getting to the question of how this is misused and, and can be used cynically in some ways. Um, and that's sort of, I mean, we see that in Crooked Plow with um, the, the two sisters, Belonisia uh, and Bibiana. Their father is like a spiritual leader. Uh, and, you know, he ends up being, uh, I guess you could say, Manipulated in, in some ways uh, by you know local political figures, local um, yeah local the powerful whether they're actually elected or not, um, and and it's interesting to see how that plays out. No romance o pai de de Bibiana e de de Belonisia, nem um líder enfim carismático e espiritual. Uh, que tem uma, um, né, os, os seguidores é muito respeitado um, e acho que o, o prefeito e também outros os outros poderosos uh, usufruem desse do desse poder do dom uh, para para utilizar um, né, para enfim para criar uma situação uh, 
que não é nada nada redentora. Né? Eu, eu fico é, curioso para saber assim como que você viu isso. assim Acho que tem tem muito a ver um pouco com, com o que você estava falando antes, da, da e, e um pouco assim a interseção entre religião e é, os poderes vigentes, digamos. Ah, ah, na história, acho que a gente tem dois tempos bem bem definidos. Um, o primeiro tempo é um tempo ah, onde a, a liderança do, do Zeca Chapéu Grande, do, do pai da Bibiana e da Belonisa, não, não rompe de todo com um certo... É, uma certa tutela que os poderosos é, mantêm sobre as pessoas e, e as mantêm também num, num, numa condição de subserviência, né? So he's saying, you know, there's the, the novel in two parts. There's a in, in sort of this first period we have this leader whose whose name is Zeca Chapéu Grande, uh, Zeca Big Big Hat, um, who you know who's Power as a spiritual leader is used not to actually, you know, uh, differently say from from the Mahdi and, and Leila's uh, book, it's it's actually used to continue to um, uh, to keep these people these people who are living and working the land subservient. É, mas eu eu aqui eu faço uma defesa porque eu percebo que é, essa esse ambiente essa proposta de conciliação também era um mecanismo de defesa para evitar que violência maior é, é, desabasse, acontecesse com aquela comunidade de trabalhadores. Essa essa perspectiva muda ah, muito depois, é, com a morte do Zeca e já num outro tempo, num outro momento, quando essas irmãs assumem uma liderança que já não é mais religiosa, talvez não seja mais espiritual, mas é, passa a ser uma liderança política de discurso e de reação contra o poder instituído. Okay. Uh, so he's saying, in, you know, in a sense too, though, you know, he feels like he 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 wants to defend Zeca Chapéu Grande because, in in a way, sort of the um, I guess you could say arrangement, which isn't, I mean, that makes it sound a little bit more formal than it is, but the original, you know, the the arrangement he has with those in power. Um, you know, it was also a mechanism to defend these people too from sort of greater violence than they were already um, facing. And then, of course, after Zeca dies, his sisters take on this sort of um, political leadership, and, and this this community that was largely a spiritual and a um, religious community begins to assume other proportions in sort of in in a reaction to to uh, the powers that be. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, Carmen, sorry, I'm going back between the, <laughs> the two languages. It's, it's getting me a, a, just a tad bit disoriented. Um, you know, it's interesting, Carmen, because you you sort of come to this um, to this question maybe from from the other lens, right? Which is, of course, not. Um, that of, of, a, of a redemptive figure, per se, but actually sort of trying to correct this record of Eve as this vilified figure. So um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how you, and in particular, I think you do so in a particularly interesting way with the narrative by bringing in voices that aren't her own, um, you know, and, and that sort of, I, yeah, I wonder what, what you know, what those, those other voices, sort of how you, what you wanted them to say for Eve, in a sense. Can I add to your question, though? You can. Because <laughs> you're saying she's vilified. Could I just add in the Christian tradition? In the Christian tradition, yes. not, in, not in your book, of course. Yes, of course. Yes, and not, not forever in the Christian tradition, not uh, forever in, 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 in the Catholic tradition. Uh, and that's what uh, also pinged my attention because, uh, in fact, I asked myself, how on earth do we have Eve when I was looking at one of these beautiful uh, mega stones of uh, Nahuatl goddess 
uh, in the Museum of the Templo Mayor in Mexico that she's so full of life and so sexy and is giving birth at the same time that she's devouring the emperor. An immense, and, and you look at her and you feel possibly some fear and admiration, but it's really the contra it, so different to it. So I had first only an intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. How on earth did we end it on Eve? So in the case of the Catholic tradition, I went to the moment when uh, the version we know is authorized also in the Catholic Bible as Eve, that by the way has some narrative issues. Um, in that same moment was the moment when St. Teresa de Avila was founding her monasteries, and it was the moment of expansion of the empire, and then they said, this is Eve, not those other Eves. So I wanted to read which were the former Eves in our tradition. And I discovered the wonderful book, Robert Graves and Patai's book, uh, that explores the Jewish myths. And there I saw that, in fact, Eve had been very different. And not necessarily Eve and Lilith, but Eve had had her own sexuality, had had her own power, had been li linked to other uh, had another sign. So that called my, that's how I kind of structured my, my imaginary Eve, or, or well, structured the imaginary. I was running, like I was running to get here, just reading and devouring the facts that I was seeing. How a figure with which I was raised aside here, because I come from a Catholic environment in Mexico of my times, and a very Catholic family. So I heard that version since ever. And that version was everywhere. My mother was the only one of all my school, of all the mothers of my school of nuns, the only mother that worked because she wanted to work. She had a profession and she had her own life, but that was totally non-proper. There was a role and I was meant to follow that role too. My mother was an exception, but another thing were the daughters. So all that made on me an internal, let's say, uh, not revolution, but at the same time that I was thinking of this, the new wave of feminism was taking over the streets of the cities of the world, the towns, and everywhere. I remember in the 70s when we were feminists, it was like, the marches were nine, 10 women, 12, 15, and then suddenly I was walking aside a crowd in Mexico City, the streets were, forget about Brooklyn Fair, that was a crowd full of women, young, all ages, the few of my age that had been there since the beginning in that second wave, because this is another wave, and all that, I mean it entered in my bones. It was all mixed up at the same time. So uh, uh, it, it wa I entered without uh, desiring to into the voice of Eve. It's not that I said, I'm going to write a novel on Eve. In fact, I thought that was preposterous. I had curiosity, intellectual curiosity. I went into the other versions of Eve. And then I said, well, let's see, maybe I'll write an essay. Maybe I'll give a seminar. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I'll forget about it. It happens with many themes. And suddenly I heard her speak. And there she came, not flawless, because yes, she recovers her, she recovers for us the earth. She recovers that pleasure of nature. She makes her own body because she comes out, they come out like Barbie and Ken without the uh, intimate parts, as was said in my nuns' school. And she is the first one that makes her own clitoris, makes her own, discovers pleasure, and Adam follows, uh, but in this binary world, she's unable to find a solution for several problems, and, and ratifies that uh, the most difficult art is real life. And in fact, 
living a beautiful life, it's also an art, and she's unable to make it. She makes a terrible mistake with Adam. And destroys, brings violence, in, not she, but then Adam, and giving away one son to Adam, and violence enters the house. So it does not have a happy ending, the novel. And in between, evidently, the daughters of Eve were not going to be just listening to their mom saying her version without complaining. They were the daughters of that Eve. So they come along also with their voices, and they have other versions. And Adam also has his version, little. Uh, and uh, the, everything starts falling differently in, in Eve's version. That means, first, he, the Eden was not what it was. Then giving birth was not what it was in theory. Then uh, her kids were not what it's told in the Genesis. And makes sense because Cain is the one that cultivates the land. Adam is the one that kills the animals first. Slave, enslaves the animals, then kills them, and then puts them in the table. So we see the complexity of their relationship inside the novel. Uh, and we have another version of everything till we arrive to Babel. I'm not going to go part by part. But that's what happens. The, the, the cards fall differently in Eve's version. Noah's Ark is not Noah's Ark, etc., etc. So she has her own version of the facts. It follows the facts of the Genesis, told differently. But her people have other opinions. And we have those scattered papers there telling their own little versions. The main voice is herself. Now, the Bible is a bit like that. There are also always some versions here and there. So follows also that uh, storytelling version. Absolutely. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, I think we're, we're getting close to our time, so I'd like to open it up uh, for questions. We have microphones here and there. Uh, so if you do have a question, I'd ask that you step up so we can hear you clearly. Thanks. Thanks for this really uh, vital panel. When writing a story narrative rooted uh, in history or mythology, is, is there a pressure to hew closely to that mythology if the people, for example, if it's tethered to a people who respect that tradition, who want to honor that tradition, but you're trying to kind of remake that tradition for your narrative. Do you feel the pressure to uh, align yourself to that straight narrative? And when you do feel that pressure, when do you decide to deviate from the traditional mytho the, the mythology or the historical narrative? Um, I work a lot in my novels. I make plans and maps of how they are going to run, but then the characters act. And it happened to me with Eve. Sometimes I was just insisting, don't go that way. But she did it. My theory is that when one finally discovers the body of the novel, a body that is constructed, yes, in fact, by the insistency of the writer, who also reads, researches, looks, thinks, etc., and has its own demons. Besides that, the novels are built by with language, and language is a common good. So they always have a, there's a pressure that comes from everywhere. And when one writes, is my feeling, is that when you finally are in the spot, I feel like an archeologist. And the art is, how do you peel the figure you discovered without ruining it? So I don't command, they command. Something so extraordinary, because it's true that I, work and work trying to build it this way. Now I'm fighting with my novel. If I'm able to publish it, it's going to be my 20th. I have several ones not published because I couldn't finish them. Uh, or I didn't feel they were what they had to be. And I've been struggling and struggling and fighting and do and respecting that intimate truth of the novel. I believe in the novel. And I believe on its tradition, its, it, the, the fluid of it, and how much all the hands of you, readers and non-readers, people around, how the sound of the streets, everything enters in the literary text. 
but that's because maybe I have magical thinking. <laughs> so I am a hard worker with magical thinking. How about you, Leila? Is it, is it all magical thinking or is it <laughs> no, <laughs> something else? I, no, I mean, it's in, in, in the case of, of history, mainstream history, I mean, we know that it's uh, written by the, the winners, it's written by the powerful, and, and uh, even if you don't set out to decolonize it, you know, intentionally, if you're only looking at it from, a, from another perspective, if you're looking at it from, uh, uh, if you're not centering Europe, if you're not centering uh, a particular part, part of the, you're, you're centering the, the people who have not been centered before, then it, it will come out as something that is, that is, that is new and that is, is, is fresh. And, uh, and, and it doesn't need to be that you're working against something as much as you're, you're, you're presenting something fresh that hasn't, been, that hasn't been presented before, simply because the focus has all been on one part of the world and on one kind of group of, of, of people. And, and that's, that's what it is, yeah. Thank you, and I'm so sorry, Itamari. I have to stop it there, I'm being told. Um, so just a reminder, um, that the authors will be signing their books at the signing table in the rotunda downstairs. Uh, Greenlight Bookstore will be uh, selling their books there. And so authors, uh, let's please go down now. Um, and a signing assistant will help you to the table. And thanks everyone for coming, really appreciate it. Thank you to my amazing panelists.